torahcafe.com. I did survive the Holocaust, but my father did not. He perished along with other six million Jews who were killed during the Holocaust. <clears throat> but one story which I remember, which he told us, he used to tell us stories about the people, the heroes of the Bible, the sages of the Talmud, the Mishnah, and foremost, the stories of Gate Sadikim, Baal Shem Tov, etc. One of those stories stuck with me, I always remembered it, and this story I can say saved my life, that I'm here today, I can speak to you, is thanks to this story which I heard from my father. Friday night, at the Shabbos table, he should tell us stories, one of those stories was, was a person not far from a neighboring city, from Mezibus, where Baal Shem Tov lived, the founder of the Hasidic movement. A person came to see the Baal Shem Tov to consult with him about something. And he said to his wife, I'm not sure when I'll be able to see the Baal Shem Tov, maybe late at night, so I stay over in Mezibus that night. I come home only next day. And of course, his wife agreed to that. Middle of the night, he actually saw, indeed, he saw Baal Shem Tov late the evening. He couldn't go back home. So he stayed over in Mezibus. Middle of the night, he gets an urgent message from his wife that he's go she's going suddenly into labor. The midwife cannot take herself, take care of herself. herself. She must have somebody should help her. So she asked her husband, although it's middle of the night, he should immediately come home. Between the town where he was living and Mezibus, where he was staying with the Baal Shem Tov, was a big, dense forest. During the daytime, people would go through this forest, it wasn't dangerous. But at night, go alone in this forest, if this forest was infested with thieves, bandits, robbers, person would be afraid to go alone. As you know, even in New York City, there are certain neighborhoods which people would be afraid to go alone at night. But since his wife asked if she urgently should come home, she so went over to the Baal Shem Tov, middle of the night, and he says to the Baal Shem Tov, I got this very urgent message from my wife. I should come home, gives the reason why. However, he says to Baal Shem Tov, I'm afraid to go alone. So Baal Shem Tov answers him, since your wife needs you, she should go immediately home. As far as what you say, you are afraid to go alone, you should know a Jew never goes alone. Wherever a Jew is, Hashem is with him. And this story, my father explained in great detail, about whatever danger a person might be, whatever crisis, difficulties a person might be, should always realize he's not alone. Hashem is always with him. And for the many, many stories which I heard from my father, Olaf Hashem, this story stuck with me, I remembered it, and you just can't imagine a child, 10, 11 years old, going through not one death camp, Auschwitz, but several, six, seven different death camps. And whatever you heard, the suffering, the torture, which we went through, is not even the tip of the iceberg. Somebody wasn't there. Simply, it's impossible ever to imagine what we went through. Now, a boy of 10 years old in Auschwitz, in Mauthausen, Mel, different death camps, 
many times I came to the conclusion it's impossible for me to continue to survive. Sooner or later, I'll just have, I'll die. So why torture yourself? Why continue? Just give yourself up, you'll be shot, and you'll be over with the sufferings. Whenever I made this decision that I cannot continue, sooner or later, I'll be finished. So why continue? I realize suicide is one of the most heinous, severest sins in Jewish religion. But I did not consider this suicide simply. I, I felt I just cannot continue this suffering, this pain, what we were enduring. And whenever I made up my mind, let me finish, the story came back to me. Although here are hundreds of thousands of Jews suffering, we meet together in Auschwitz. But I'm not alone. Hashem is with me, and see, eventually I'll make it, I'll survive. Let me give you a specific example of this. But before that, this story I shared that you should know, bear where he is, under any circumstances and conditions, He's never, never alone in any difficulty, crisis, sufferings. I shared this story with many other people. Just three months ago, a prominent person from Crown Heights came over to me, and he tells me, that he has to undergo next week a triple bypass. He's in his 50s. He's very much afraid. So he comes to consult with me and asks me a broche. So I tell him a broche for me. Let me tell you a story. And I tell him this story. And I say to him, be sure, be confident, be assured. When you'll be rolled in into the surgery room, the operating room. Yes, be confident that you are not going alone. As you go into the surgery room, somebody will be with you, Hashem, telling the story in detail, and he'll make sure the doctors should operate on you and you come out good, in good health successfully. And of course, I gave him a brach. Every Jew can give a brach. I gave him the brach that everything should be okay. It should be even healthier than before. But I tell him, yes, be assured and be confident as you're going into the surgery room. Not only you go, but Hashem also goes with you. Two weeks later, after the surgery, comes to my home, to my house, thanks me. He's very grateful. He says, I went with such bitachon, with such self-assurance, such, such confidence, it helped me. And Baruch Hashem, the triple bypass was very successful. Just like this story helped me and this person, as I shared this story with other people, it also helped many, many other people in whatever difficulties and crisis it might be, this gave them the courage, the self-confidence to overcome this difficulty. Let me cite a specific example. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you, maybe all of you heard the death march. In, at the beginning of 1945, as the Russian army approached, came to Poland, came closer to Auschwitz, the Germans wouldn't let any Jew to be liberated, saved by the, German, by the Russian army, they evacuated the hundreds of thousands of inmates were still in, in, in Auschwitz. And we evacuated hundreds of thousands of people from Auschwitz to Germany. And this was called the Death March. Why was it called the Death March? Because we sent, started out hundreds of thousands of Jews. But these few weeks that we were marching from Poland to Germany, up a mountain between Germany and, and Poland, the huge, big mountains. It was January, February, March, tremendously cold. 
and marching day, on, day in and, and day out, day and night, without any food, what would they, what would they eat? Only the dirty, muddy snow on which thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people tread. That's what the only food which we ate. People were dying like flies. That withered away. Moreover, as you know, the Germans are very punctual, yakis, straight. This march of the Jews, miles and miles on an end, but had to be a straight line from both sides. If anybody just moved out a few inches from the straight line, they had to go fast, march, up a mountain, down a mountain. Anybody marched out or just stayed out from these lines a few inches, immediately was shot. So both sides of this marching, you see piles, mountains of dead people. And I was amongst these hundreds of thousands of people who were marching the death march from Poland, from Auschwitz to Germany. After several days, without any food, running fast, my shoe was oversized. As I was marching and put my shoe into the snow, and since the opening of the shoe was much larger, the hole that was necessary for my foot. So my foot, the shoe stuck in the snow. My foot came out and that's, and I had to go fast. So eventually I just couldn't do it anymore. So what did I do instead of picking up my foot with the shoe, but which always stuck in the snow, I started to, start to push the shoe. Heavy leather, coarse leather, and as I was pushing for several days with my foot, the shoe in the snow, eventually it bore a big hole in my foot. And as I was pushing the shoe, the pain, every time I just pushed it until all the flesh, the skin, the flesh, all was torn away and it went all the way to the bone. And as I was pushing this, this shoe, I couldn't go without a shoe in the snow. I saw every star in the sky. The pain was unimaginable, but I had no choice. So I kept on pushing, walking, marching, and pushing this shoe. Eventually, from the pain, my foot became numb. I didn't feel it anymore. So, so I couldn't even pick up my foot anymore. Eventually, not only my foot, the entire leg till the thigh became completely like semi-paralyzed, numb. I couldn't walk anymore. So then and there, I came again to my this decision, to my conclusion, that how long can I still endure this suffering? One leg is out of commission. And we have to run fast. Sooner or later, I'll be trampled underfoot by the people who are marching with us, with me. Or simply, I just, what, can I, what will happen to me? So I decided, this is the end. I can't continue anymore. I give up, I just march out a few inches from the line, and I'll be shot and finished. Ladies and gentlemen, believe me, as I made this firm decision, and several times before I also made this decision, but every time the story that I'm not alone came to me, and just push yourself, try, and eventually you'll succeed. But it, happened, it lasted, this decision, this result for one day, another day. I came on it, my foot was completely, I couldn't walk, I didn't feel my left leg anymore. So then I made the decision, that's it. For whatever, yes, Hashem is with me, but Hashem chose not to help me. I didn't question why, but I just realized I cannot continue. <clears throat> As I made this decision, I was in the middle of the line, to move out, 
these few inches, suddenly a young man comes over to me and starts to, me, starts to engage with me on a conversation. Now mind you, in this death march, there are hundreds of thousands of people, nobody but nobody engaged in any conversation. Just imagine, you're on a boat, and the boat capsizes. Everybody jumps into the ocean, into the sea, and try to swim to save yourself. Are going then to engage in a conversation, how are you, where you come from? Everybody only has one thought in his mind. How can I save myself? This was exactly the thought in this death march. There was absolutely silence, nobody, no conversation. This young man comes over to me and starts to speak with me. I was astonished. And we were speaking, he asked where I come from, my name, where I come from. Eventually found out that we come from the same city, Czechoslovakia, Kosice, where I was born, he was born. He comes from the same city. I was then already 10 years old, 10 and a half years old. By that time, he was, uh, he was then 80 years old. So I tell him, listen, I can't continue our conversation because this is my problem. I'm suffering, in pain, I just, I can't walk anymore. She says to him, so I tell him, please, I just uh, uh, walk out from, from, the, from the line, a few inches, I'll be shot. Please, you're much stronger than me, you're older than me, you'll survive, you'll come home to Kosice, where I come from, where you come from. Tell my parents, hopefully, they'll come back also, Tell them what happened to, to, to me, love them very much, and I simply I couldn't continue anymore. I just walked, I marched, uh, walked out from the line and I was shot. And tell them where, what day it was, they should be able to keep the yard site for me. And maybe after the war they'll be able to come and maybe somewhere strewn in the fields they'll find me. She tells me, no, 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 don't do that. She says, but what can I do? I can't walk anymore. He tells me, I'll help you. So I ask him, how can you help me? Can you carry me? Can you slap me? He says to me, put your hands on my shoulder and I'll help you to walk. So again, since the story that he is never alone and when I made this firm, resolute decision to walk out and this, in this instant, this person came over to me so he decided, I'll give it another chance. And I was holding on this person's shoulder and hopping on my, left fo uh, my uh, right foot and slapping, just dragging my left foot. <clears throat> now how long can you hop even though somebody helps you put your hands on his shoulder? and he slaps you, for how long can you hop on one foot? After a day or two, even my right foot didn't work too much, and I just couldn't continue. So I tell him, listen, I'm appreciating, and Hashem will certainly pay you back what you did for me. You tried to save my life, but simply I cannot continue. My left foot is out of commission completely, my right foot is, my right, right foot, my right leg is also going. I'll just move out and I'll be shot. And please tell my parents what happened to me. Ladies and gentlemen, the second time, even he could not anymore persuade me or dissuade me, I shouldn't take this and this step. I should be shot. As I'm about to move out from the line, an SS officer comes over to me and he starts to, to speak with me. In Czechoslovakia, every Jew spoke several languages. We spoke Czech, we spoke Hungarian, we spoke Yiddish, and we also spoke German. My mother tongue was German. So I spoke a perfect German. This SS comes over to me and starts a conversation. who is my father, where I come from, my name, etc. Then I tell him, listen, I was just about to move out from the line. I should be shot by one of the SS people. 
please do, you do it for me because I can't continue. These were the words of this SS officer. Tells me, don't do it. You survive the war, you come home, and you find, you see your parents and your sister. But I tell him, I can't continue, I'm so weak. For the last two, three weeks, I didn't do anything except this muddy snow. My I told him the problem with my left foot, left, uh, left leg, foot, my right one. And he says, I'm hungry, I'm weak, I can't continue. He had on his belt a canteen, a bottle. He takes off this canteen, hot, sweet coffee, and he opens up this canteen and gives it to me. Ladies and gentlemen, our sages tell us, how be Tchiyatam Beisim, resurrection, it's called Tal Tchia, the Jew of revival, Hashem in all the people, the millions of people of the past who passed away, Hashem is going to give them a little Jew of this revival, and through this will be resurrection. When I drank this canteen, this coffee, this sweet, hot, black coffee, it truly went through my, all my muscles, all my veins, all my organs, all my limbs. I felt reinvigorated, rejuvenated. I felt truly that I had energy. And we still continued conversing a little while. And then this SS officer disappeared. I didn't see him. How he left. Of course, it wasn't a wonder because we had to go very fast. But we stopped. We just had to go very fast. A few hours later, this SS man is here again. Again, he started a conversation with me, started to speak. What did my father do? What did he learn? What did he study? What did I... All kinds of family things. <clears throat> and again, I told him I was so weak. So he gave me again this black coffee. Periodically, every few hours, as I finished the coffee, we still continued speaking. After a few hours, and every, uh, uh, he disappeared. And every few hours, this SS man reappeared, and he gave me the coffee. One day, he comes, and we went a particular very steep, very high mountain miles, miles up this mountain, and eventually down the mountain. Very exhausting, very tiresome. But it also, since it was February, cold, tremendously cold. So when he comes, I tell him, listen, he gives me the coffee, but I tell him my ears are freezing. I just can't take it, my ears are freezing. Ladies and gentlemen, this SS man takes off his cap, puts it on my, on my head, pulls it over my ears, and I was walking for the next marching for the next few days in this SS cap, and he was walking or marching bareheaded. I don't know what would have happened if an SS would see that I have an SS cap, where did I steal it from? But anyways, I was marching with this SS cap, and he was going without a, a cap. A few days later, he comes to me, and every day he comes, every day. But it was a few days later. And usually after he would, we would start a conversation, would speak for a few minutes, he would take off the canteen and give it to me to drink. This time we're walking and speaking and speaking and walking. And he doesn't give me the coffee. I know after a few days, after a week, I felt I'm entitled. You know, entitlement programs. I, I thought I'm entitled from the SS to get my coffee, so I didn't ask, she just asked him, no, where's the coffee? She says, I'm sorry to tell you, even I don't have any more coffee. He uh, takes off the canteen from his belt, opens it up, turns it upside down, he says, if we, we don't have any coffee, I don't have any coffee. So I tell him, if that's the case, I'm so emaciated, so weak, so exhausted, just let me go out, and, 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 and from, from, the, from the line and shoot me. She tells me again, you'll survive and you'll come back to Czechoslovakia, you'll find your parents and your sister. And I tell him, but I cannot walk. Simple, this gave me some energy, this sweet, hot coffee. 
He said, Sam, I can't walk anymore. You know what he did? I was holding to my friend like this, that he was schlepping me, dragging me. And I said, I can't continue. So this SS took me under my arm. He says, in six kilometers from here, we come to a German village. Then I go into a house and I'll get you coffee. But I said, continue. I said, but I cannot. So then he took me by, by my arm and I was holding like this and he was schlepping me for the next six kilometers further uh, until we come to this village. Eventually we reached this village. He went at a, at a home, a German home, because we had to rush further ahead. He, um, he got the coffee, he ran after me. He gave me the black, good, hot coffee, but this time it wasn't sweet anymore. His coffee was always sweet. I you know sugar is energy, this really revitalized me, but this was just plain coffee. Then he tells me, <clears throat> Now you have to give me back my cab. I didn't know why did he suddenly insist I should give him back his cab. I gave him back my, his cab, put on his head. I finished the coffee, he left. And I've never seen this SS again. When I came back after the war, came back to Czechoslovakia, to Kosice, I started to write my memoirs, the different, the seven different death camps, everything what transpired, everything what I went through. When I came to, to describe this death march, this episode, in much greater, of course, much greater detail that I'm saying here, when I came to the end that this SS took back his cap and I'd never seen him again, so I just finished off this chapter, actually several chapters, says, who was this SS? Was it truly a German SS? Maybe, perhaps, perhaps, Hashem sent down Elijah Novi, Elijah the prophet, in disguise of a German officer. And I mentioned there a couple of stories in the Talmud. Hashem sometimes sends Elijah Elijah Novi to help a Jew, especially a child, or Malach Michoel, the archangel Michoel, said perhaps it was them, one of them, in disguise of a, a German officer. And then I continued. Even suppose he was a German officer, not Elijah, not Malach Michoel, and then describe who were those German gods who watched us. The scum of the earth, the worst criminals, murderers, rapists, anybody else uh, Hitler didn't send to Auschwitz. The worst criminals from, from, from the prisons, from the jail, he sent to us for them to kill a Jew. As you know, they killed a million and a half innocent little children. For them to kill a child, a Jew, but m less difficult than for me to kill a mosquito which stings me, which bites me. So I, I, this SS officer should suddenly have rachmones or compassion for little Jewish boys, not less of a miracle than would be Elijah the prophet or Mark Michoel. Anyways, this story is not the story which I heard from my father. You never, a Jew is never alone. Under all circumstances and under any conditions, somebody will help you. This saved my life then, and many other cases in the other death camps also. Then you can say it's an isolated incident with me, but how about other Jews? Did they have, the question is, where was God? I never, in you know, different sufferings in death camps, I never, never had a question, where is God? Because the this this story told me loud and clear God is with me in the Holocaust in Auschwitz or Mauthausen or Melk or Gimskischen, different death camps. I never this question. Then you can say this is an isolated case, a little boy who had a good religious upbringing, but how about other Jews in these death camps? <clears throat> Let 
Let me tell you, milk, if whatever you know about Auschwitz, milk was infinitely worse. Infinitely worse. If anybody just disobeyed any rule, immediately he wasn't shot, he was hung. Whenever we came back from work, seven o'clock at night, we went to work five o'clock in the morning, we came back seven o'clock at night, around the fence of this notorious camp, Melk, we saw always scores and scores of Jews hanging with their hands up until they, 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 they perished, and tens, 20, 25, always every day new ones. You just can imagine this camp, Melk. So suddenly, as we were, as we came back from work, they gave us a little bit about to eat, and eventually we had to go to sleep because every limb, every muscle was aching and pained. <clears throat> as we were all laying, it was our triple tiered beds, and suddenly, I don't know how anybody could know that tonight is Pesach, Passover. And we heard in this barrack, which we were, over a thousand people, well over a thousand people. As we heard, tonight is Pesach, everybody jumped up from his cot, from his bed. We sat at the edge of these cot beds, and we said, today's Passover, we have to make a Seder. Of course, there was no food, nothing, how can we celebrate Pesach? But let's at least celebrate Pesach, Passover, saying the Agode. But did we have an Agode? Did we have this prayer, this Agode book? So anybody, whoever, whatever, remember, remember it said it loud, and the whole barrack also said it. I, I remembered the Manishtano. Every child knows Manishtano. I knew the Hallel by heart, so I said loud. My child's voice, I sang, said Manishtano. Everybody repeated Manishtano. Then I said, Hallel, this person knows Nishmas. And we celebrated Passover in Melk in this terrible camp. As we were singing Animamin, singing, celebrating Passover in Melk, suddenly an SS comes in. When he heard the noise, he heard the singing, what's going on? She comes into the barrack and says, everybody sits. But this time, everybody would already lay just to rest, because next morning, 5 o'clock, we have to get up. So uh, as we were singing and deciding that God, whatever we, we remembered, so I says, says what's, what's going on? Why don't you lay down? And he takes the rifle, and he says, if you don't go to sleep, you'll be all shot. And ladies and gentlemen, it just wasn't just a, a threat. But then for us, he would have gotten a medal if he would kill Jews. So of course, everybody hit. So it was the pillow, there was no pillows, it was just planks of wood. And everybody lay down. And he walked out from the barrack. Door was closed. Everybody as one spontaneously jumped up. And we continued celebrating the Pesach Passover in Melk that night. Maybe 10, 15 minutes later, when he heard again the commotion, the singing of so many Jews, he came in again, screaming with his rifle, he says, if this happens once or lay down, if this happens once more, all of you will be shot. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I saw how SS, when his, anybody disobeyed his command, he just took this automatic rifle and he just shot like this several hundred people, which I saw several times. So it wasn't, again, just wasn't just a, a warning or a threat. It could have very easily been. So everybody again lay down, and he walked out. That time, 10 o'clock in every lager, with Auschwitz, Birkenau, Malta, all these lagers. The light went out 10 o'clock. The light went out. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, everybody jumped up a third time. Today is Pesach, we have to celebrate Pesach. After two threats that risking our life, everybody jumped up in milk in this back. I don't know what happened in other barracks. 
There are many, many barracks. Our barrack, which had over 1,000 people, everybody jumped up the third time, and we continued singing and celebrating Pesach. He came in, a, when the, the light was dark already, he came to the barrack, and he didn't say one word, he just looked around, and he walked out without killing us, shooting us, without doing anything to us, he just walked out. Now, among this thousand, or over a thousand people, would you say everybody was religious observant uh, from Jew? Certainly not. I'm sure there were many non-observant Jews also uh, in this bag, um, 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 over a thousand people. Now, uh, the question is, they could have said to us who wanted to celebrate, why do you endanger their life? If you want to celebrate, go out, because when he, this SS, threatened with his rifle, I'm going to shoot all of you, could have been very, very easily, and most likely, could have happened. But not one voice of protest ever heard a whole night we were celebrating, and not one voice of protest, don't do it, don't endanger, don't risk our life. Even those who at home, from home, were not observant Jews, but something at the pintle yeet, the inner spark of Pesach, suddenly became, started to sprout. And even they also celebrated sang along with us. When I came home and I wrote about this, also this, this story, I was to myself, I was questioning. What did we celebrate Pesach? What is Pesach? What is Passover? The festival of liberation, of freedom. We were free. I we liberated. We suffered in Auschwitz, the different camps, much more than the Jews in Egypt. The Jews in Egypt were enslaved, but at least they could stay with their wives and their children and what to eat. They had homes. We were separated. I was alone without my mother, without my father, without my sister, with my grandparents. Everybody's torn away without any food. What did we celebrate? What kind of freedom? What kind of festival is this? In this moment of Passover, nobody asked any question. Hashem said, we have to celebrate Pesach, the festival, the Yontif, of freedom, of liberation. Everybody felt himself free, everybody felt liberated. This is the point which I said before. Not only I as an individual felt, praise God, in the Holocaust, with us, with me. All those many, many Jews, thousands of Jews, that one person protested or stopped us from celebrating Pesach. Let me tell you a third story. In Auschwitz, as you know, they killed a million and a half Jewish children. Besides the six million Jews, every child and that many, many, many stories. But I'll just, I'd like to pick out one story. When we came into the gas chamber, just in a form of a showering, like you can take a, a shower, you wash yourself. Eventually, you had to, before you went into the shower, or this gas chamber, you had to undress yourself completely naked. And those who came out would get the new, new uh, uniforms, as you know, this grayish, bluish, striped uniform that the Jews had in the Holocaust. When I came out from the shower, and the SS were giving to everybody the uniform, first of all, I did not recognize my father. Completely different. His hair was sharing. But anyways, this, this is not the point which I want to make. When it came to me, they have to give me a uniform. In Auschwitz, there's no uniforms for children. Because every child was killed. So me, they didn't have, I, I stripped myself naked, took off all my clothes. After the, uh, then we had to go a different place that, that, for the shower. 
which the SS distributed the uniforms. For me, there was no uniform. So what did this SS general tells me? You go back to the pile of dre uh, 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 dresses where you were undressed, your suits and dresses and so on, find your own clothes, and you'll, be, you'll bear your own clothes. Because they have for me a uniform. So I went to this place, a mountain, speaking of thousands of Jews, a mountain of clothes. But I luckily I knew I was addressed with my father and this in this place. So I was looking and searching until eventually I found my little suit, my shoes, and so on. Then I thought to myself, I'm here now. My father always carried in his pocket, because he's traveling a lot, he had two pairs of fill-in, a larger size and a smaller size when he was traveling. In the trains, he had a large, smaller, a smaller fill-in. The smaller pair of fill-in always had it in his pocket. So I thought to myself, if I'm here, why should I also take along, find my father's pants, this pair of small fill-in, I'll take it into the lager, into the camp. I did it. I also found in his pocket, I don't know how, a sardine. But there's, I took this sardine, and I took this little pair of filling, and I came back, and then we went into this lager, into the camp of Auschwitz. Ladies and gentlemen, you just can't imagine what this meant to my father. Tears were rolling down his cheek, because nobody had anything not filling, no safer, nothing, nothing, nothing. Only we had this uniform which they gave us. And suddenly my father had a pair of filling. As we were in this lager in Auschwitz, and we had to go to work, we were woken up 4 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock at night, people got wind of that my father has a pair of filling. People would wake up early, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, early morning, come to my father, should give him, give them the pay of filling. Hundreds and hundreds of people from 12 o'clock till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning will end up in the, in the barrack. Now just imagine if an SS would see this, immediately, not only the one who has that filling would be shot, but all these people who were lining up to put on filling. And this was going on every night until my father was in Auschwitz. Eventually, he was evacuated. And then, I, since then, I never saw my father again. But just wanted to point out to you, people think in Auschwitz, people ask the question, where is God in Auschwitz? Most, most people, I cannot vouch for everybody but millions of Jews, but I've never heard in Auschwitz this question where is God? I felt it because of the story, but I said, all the other people, which I said Passover, filling, can tell you with other festivals as well, but anyways, this question only has arisen. Afterwards, in Auschwitz, everybody was conscious and felt the presence of God. Now the question can be asked, indeed, if those people who did survive, survived miraculously, with the help of Hashem, where was God? Why didn't God also help those six million Jews who did perish, who did not uh, survive? Why didn't Akush Baruch, why didn't Hashem, God Almighty, why didn't help them also? The answer, obviously, is a most complicated question, and the answers are even more complicated, but let me try to present to you several answers. Uh, how we can explain this difficult, painful phenomenon. One of the answers, atheism. God forbid there's no God. If the God doesn't exist, as you know, this is a, a very prominent field in secular philosophy. God doesn't exist, everything's only illusion, imagination, but God doesn't exist. So the cause of it, the whole question is moot. If God doesn't exist, whom do you protest? Who could have helped you? We don't have to go too much into it. Just let me tell parenthetically. Once 
many years ago, my wife is here now, and she remembers, once we went Friday afternoon on Orchard Street in Lower East Side, New York. It was Friday afternoon in Orchard Street, all the, the merchandise out on the streets, the vendors stand on the street, and they sell you all kinds of good, uh, cheap merchandise. As we are walking with my wife, Friday afternoon, Orchard Street, Lower East Side, and it was, uh, we, we heard it already because it's getting late for Shabbos, and it's Lower East Side, Manhattan, and we live in Brooklyn, Crown Heights. So while a person comes over, a vendor, comes over to me and says, young man, I have very beautiful, good shirts, and very cheap. Why do you come and buy it? So I tell this person, I like to buy a metzia, something which is cheap, something good. I like to buy it, not now. Asks me, why not now? He says, because it's Friday afternoon, and I'd like to get a, a home as soon as possible because of Shabbos. So this person tells me, Shabbos? You still believe in Shabbos? What is Shabbos? What Shabbos is? For Shabbos, you forgo such a good, beautiful shirt and, and so, uh, so cheap. So once he started to challenge me with Shabbos, I said, so what do you mean Shabbos? Of course, for me, Shabbos is very important. So he says, you still believe in God? He says, most definitely. And I tell him, and how about you? He says, I was in Auschwitz. And he beats his chest like this. He says, I was in Auschwitz. Anybody what saw this atrocity, this barbarism, Auschwitz cannot believe that God exists. Otherwise, how did he permit such a thing? So I tell him, tell me, what did you see in Auschwitz that I didn't see? What did you experience in Auschwitz that I didn't experience? He says, you were a kid. You were in Europe or your child. But you know what, what was Auschwitz? Ladies and gentlemen, I pulled back my sleeve, opened my shirt, I showed him my tattoo. He says, I was in Auschwitz. I wasn't then, you could have been then 25 years old, 30 years old. I was a child of 10 years old. And I still believe in God. When, he, when I told him this and I, he saw my tattoo on my arm, this person's face turned white as my shirt is white. He went into his office, his, he slumped down in his chair, and he was immersed in his thoughts. Here I said to my wife, I cannot leave. I have to see what will be with this person. We went into his office, and he was so immersed in his thoughts, I didn't want to be, uh, disturb him. And we waited that a few minutes, because he could not imagine anybody in Auschwitz can still believe in God. So um, after a few minutes, I just left, we went home, a few months later, we came back, my wife and I came back again to um, Orchard Street. This man, the store was sold to somebody else. What happened to this person, I don't know. But this person, the tshuva for everything what he did since the Holocaust, I just don't know. I can only tell you what happened. This person, the store was sold to somebody else, and what happened to him, I just don't know. But anyways, to say that God, this itself would require a full lecture, how we can dismiss the absurdity of atheism. A person doesn't even believe in God. The question, how can you say that God doesn't exist is more improbable, more absurd, more illogical than the question, where was God, why didn't he help us? So I will not spend too much time or to dismiss this idea that God, uh, atheism, uh, Hashem, uh, uh, doesn't exist, consequently, whom should be asked? There's another school of thought, which is called deism. The God does exist. The God did create the world, but is below his dignity, this mundane physical world, is too inferior, too low for Hashem's interest. So Hashem left, abandoned this world, and Hashem is up in the seventh heaven. He's not concerned, not involved with the fear of man. So consequently, whatever happened is not Hashem's fault because he doesn't know what goes on in this world. This is called deism in philosophy. This would also would require a whole lecture how we can dis, uh, dismiss or how can disprove this idea. God did create the world, but after he found it, below his dignities. Why did he create it altogether? But anyways, this is also an explanation. 
Then is a third um, explanation. Which this we find even amongst religious philosophers and even amongst rabbis. The, uh, the um, Holocaust came as a result of sin transgressions with the Am Israel, the Jewish people transgressed and committed so many sins. Generations after generations accumulated until the path was overfilling and Hashem, that's why, made the Holocaust to punish because of the sins which the Jews did. And this is based also upon the say of what our sages tell us, in Misa, there is no death without sin. There is no suffering, nobody suffers without sinning. So causing this death of six million Jews and all this tremendous, tremendous suffering the Jews suffered is based upon the statements of our sages, in Misa Bloichet, and that's how they try to explain or interpret the Holocaust. This is the result of this accumulated sins of the many, many generations with the Jews committed. But ladies and gentlemen, even this is very improbable. This should be the explanation. Why? If because of sins did a million and a half Jewish children, they sinned, there are plenty of sinners during the time of the Holocaust, but only the sinners suffered. A million and a half Jewish children, completely innocent. Why did they perish in the Holocaust? There were many, many great Sadiqim, great sages. Many observant Jews, I can testify with my own father. He never missed any mitzvah, anything which I do as to observe. He's a fully observant person. Why did he deserve to be killed, to perish in the Holocaust? And I would say the majority of the Jews, the six million Jews, were killed in the Holocaust besides the million and a half children who were completely innocent, didn't deserve any, any punishment, but even the majority of Jews who were full observant from good people. So what else? What? So this also is very difficult to explain. The simplest explanation which most people give, it's described, once we understand who is God, God is infinite, beyond that understanding, Hashem is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and infinite. Can a human finite mind understand the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the intellect of God? Can we try to criticize or to understand what Akishbar who did, if it's good or bad? So this is the explanation which most people give. We cannot ask, we have to wait until Mashiach comes, and then everything will be explained, and everything will be understood, and... Uh, uh, <coughs> I'd like to leave also some uh, little time for questions and answers. So let me just go to the fifth explanation. Let me preface this fifth explanation. And this fifth explanation, which I'm going to, to, to mention here, I wrote to the Rebbe and asked the Rebbe whether this explanation is correct or not. And the Rebbe did agree with this explanation. But let me just preface this explanation with a little dialogue between Hashem and between Moshe Rabin and Hashem. Moshe Rabin himself had also this question. Why does human suffering, the theodicy, human suffering, Hashem, a, a, a compassionate, a almighty God, why does he per permit so much suffering in the world? 
Moshe Rabbeinu, when he, uh, he addressed this question to Hashem, in the Chumash, in the Bible, in the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God Almighty, Harinu Rezdarkecho, show me your ways, explain me your ways, what's going on in the world, why is it good people suffer, evil people prosper. Tzadik Veraloi, Rosh Vetavloi. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What did Hashem respond? What did Hashem reply to Moshe Rabbeinu? Not as you cannot understand, Hashem said, but Isis Achoyrai, you'll see my back upon Allah Yiro, but my face, my countenance, this you cannot see. Everyone understands Hashem has no back, Hashem has no face or countenance, Hashem is not a physical being or entity. What does it mean? Hashem says, you'll see my back. You can see my back, but you cannot see my, uh, my front, my face. Hashem and our sages explain. The face means when you, a, a person is confronted face to face with a difficult, painful situation. And it makes no sense. Why did Akash Baruch, why did God permit such a situation? When you look at it, pony by pony, face to face, we are faced with a, a, a difficult case, you cannot understand Hashem's ways. Pon me, pon am lo yiro. When you're faced with this critical thing, you cannot understand it. However, uh, but you can see my back later, years later, sometimes days later, weeks later, months later, years later, things which at that moment when it happened made no sense whatsoever, but you see it later, in later years, things you see have more information, the things makes to you a lot of sense. Let me, the classical example of this is the famous story with Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Kiva, when he traveled, he always took along with him. He was traveling on a donkey. In those days, there's no uh, cars or coaches. He was traveling on a donkey. He always took with him also a rooster because he used to get up middle of the night for the midnight prayers. He also took along a lantern in at night. He should be able to see when he studies or he learns. He came to a certain town, the Talmud tells us, and he wanted to stay over uh, in this town. And as he comes to the gate, the gate closed, and he couldn't enter this town. He felt very bad, very, very bad to find our lodging. The gates are closed. He had no choice. He had to stay over in the field, nearby in the field, a cold, wet field. He felt terrible. How can you sleep in this cold, wet field? And ladies and gentlemen, but that's why he had no choice. And he was uh, laying, resting in this cold, wet field outside of the town. Suddenly comes a big storm wind that extinguishes the lantern. She has no more light. Then comes his darkness, comes a fox, eats up his rooster. He does not have the alarm clock. The rooster served as his alarm clock. Then comes a, a lion and devours his donkey. He's bereft of everything. No more donkey, how can I travel? No more rooster with his alarm clock, and no more the lantern. Says the Christ said, I me, why do you do this to me? I want to study Torah. I want to pray. Why do you do this to me? Next day, he goes, gets up, goes to the town. What did he find out? A group of bandits entered this town, murdered every inhabitant, uh, looted the whole town. And if Rabbi Kiva would have been in, in this town, he'd been killed along with all, the, uh, with all the people. So then Rabbi Kiva realized, and then he exclaimed, What Hashem does is only for the good. So many times, if you would have all the information, or people would have known the information, what would be later, he would have understood that this is not something bad, adversity bad, this itself is good. So then he realized in a retrospect how the, from the past he understood the present. Ladies and gentlemen, the classical work in the Torah which discusses human suffering. How come righteous good people suffer? How come evildoers? prosper, 
the most fundamental, most classical work is obviously the work of Eof. Let me at least briefly analyze what the Torah speaks about of the, this is the work of theodicy of human suffering. At the beginning of Eof, the Torah describes who was Job. Ish Tamba Yosher, a perfect, upright person. Yerelikim, a God-fearing person. Sur Merah, he removed himself from anything evil, was only good and kind to everybody. And the Torah testifies that he was a God-fearing, a perfect, good person. You can be sure the Torah doesn't exaggerate. He was com completely, a perfectly righteous person. Then the Torah says, describes his family. Seven sons, and three most beautiful daughters, extremely wealthy and rich and successful, famous, renowned person, who helped everybody. And then the, the, uh, the, the Eof, he continues, suddenly he lost all his riches, all his wealth, became completely impoverished, he lost everything. After what happened to him, his seven sons died. A plague, an epidemic happened. His first, the seven sons died. Afterwards, his three most beautiful daughters died. Eventually, he was afflicted with painful sores from head to toe. He couldn't even wear clothes. Suffering. These are the first two chapters of Job. And he did not lose faith in God. His wife only said to him, how long will you still believe in God? Don't you see what's happening to you? Do you deserve such a fate? And he says, why are you such a foolish lady? We should accept only the good, what God gives us good. This is what you should accept. But bad we shouldn't accept. And he still didn't disbelieve the Torah says in his lips with his mouth. He still spoke nicely about God. But I see his lips deep inside his mind and his heart had already questions for the divine justice. Is God just? How come he does all to me? He, did, he wouldn't articulate, he wouldn't utter this blasphemy against God. But in his heart, he did have this question. Ladies and gentlemen, for the next 42, then he had three of his best friends, also famous, famous personalities. They come when they heard his suffering, his affliction. They came to console him, to comfort him. For the first seven days when they saw him, they did not recognize him, how he looked. Let me tell you. After two months, eventually I met my sister in Auschwitz. Believe me, I didn't recognize my sister. The, her hair didn't grow, her nails didn't grow. It was only skin and bones. But I, I, simply, I didn't recognize her until I heard her voice. I did, and she took, called my name. I didn't recognize her. So there's the seven best friends. They came and they met Job. They didn't recognize him. And they were sitting there crying with him together for seven days not uttering one word. After seven days, a dialogue ensues. What's, what's the justice in this world? Is there justice in this world? Does God, God know what's going on? As I said, atheism, deism, and all these different ideas which we were discussing before, they were discussing. It goes for 42 long chapters. And they keep on saying, God is just. So Job asks, so why do I suffer? What did I do? So he says, what do you say? If, uh, if you didn't sin, Hashem would this do to you. So God is unjust and you are just. And this is the whole discussion. They want to prove that Eof must have sinned. Otherwise, he couldn't suffer because God is a compassionate, merciful, a just God. And he maintains not true. And this is the whole discussion for 42 chapters. Ladies and gentlemen, the last two chapters, a fourth person appears. His name is Elihu. 
and they live in a very cryptic, mysterious discussion with EF, which just superficial, which is maybe just learn, study it. And just the simple English translation, as I said, is very mysterious, very cryptic, and, uh, and the meaning is not clear. And suddenly, as soon as this Eliu starts to speak with Eof, Eof protests for 40, two, 40 chapters, I'm innocent. Suddenly, Eof agrees that God is just, and it's his, problem, his fault, and accepts the fate of Hashem, what Hashem did to him. Ladies and gentlemen, what, what, what did Eliu say? What is this mysterious message which Eliu, Eliu says to Eof, suddenly Eof accepts his fate, doesn't question anymore God, he says God is right and I'm wrong. This is the concept when they told, when Eliu said to, to, um, to Eof, you are absolutely right, you are a tzaddik. The Torah says you are a tzaddik. You are a decent, honest, good man. You helped other people. You absolutely don't deserve the fate which happens to you. But you know why, why you suffer? Not for something which you did in this lifetime. You pay a price for something which you did previously. And once he mentioned this to Eof, and said, what did you do previously? What did you do previously? As you know, Pharaoh, I'd like to give a question and answer period. Pharaoh, then before he, he, he decided to make the final Solution. Hitler wanted to make the, bring the final solution to the Jewish problem, to kill all Jews. Who was the first one before them? It was Pharaoh. But Pharaoh was afraid of the Jewish God. So he took three counselors, three advisors, and he discussed with them, can I exterminate Am Israel? Who were his three counselors? One was Bilam, the, the notorious anti-Semite, Bilam. The second one was Yitro, the father of Moshe Rabbeinu. And the third one was Eof. Paris says, I want to exterminate the Jews. What do you say? Should I do it or not? He asked first Bilam, he says, of course do it. Let's once and for all get rid of Am Yisrael. He said, there are two voices for, for, to, to, to kill the Jews. Then he asked Yitro, what should I do? What's your opinion? Yitro says, don't dare to do that. Hashem will severely punish you. Am Yisrael, the people of Hashem's eyes, and Am Yisrael will never, never be exterminated. Don't do it. So he has two against one, Pharaoh and Bilam. And then he had Yitro against him. So he asked Eof, what should I do? He says, I say, just tell us, Eof was silent. He didn't say yes, he didn't say no. So two against two. If Eof was decided, but I mean, then it was two against one. Paroi and Bilam against Yitro because Eof was silent. If he would have also sided with Yitro, obviously with the, the, the Jewish children would be thrown in the Nile, and all the suffering in Mitzrayim would have taken place. Because of Eof was silent, that's why all this tragedy with the, uh, the uh, Jewish children were killed and didn't suffer for, uh, uh, such a hard labor in Mitzrayim, it's only because of Yitra, of, of Eof. Once Eof realized, why, is he pay, uh, why does he suffer? He's paying a price for some which he incurred before. And this is a tikkun nefesh. This is a rectification for his soul, which he caused so many Jews should be killed then he said, of course God is just that I'm wrong. Let me just give you for this idea, which we call Gilgulim. One more example. Do you know who was, who saved Moshe Rabbeinu? The daughter of Pharaoh. If anybody has to listen to a decree of a king, certainly has to be his own daughter. Pharaoh made the decree every Jewish boy should be thrown to the Nile, be drowned. His own daughter certainly should have obeyed this law. But she didn't. When she saw Moshe Rabbeinu, she saved him. She, him, she, she brought him to the palace 
and she pleaded with Pharaoh, her father, please make exception with the Jewish boy. And Pharaoh acquiesced, and Moshe was saved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, why did she do it? Why did, why did she, she, she save a little boy and defy her own father? Do you know what was the name of, of Bas Paro, the daughter of Paro? What, were her, what was her name? In Chronicles, in Tanakh, it's mentioned Bas Paro's name was Batya. Batya. What does Batya mean? Bat, Ka, the daughter of God. What do you mean she's the daughter of God? It says in the Zohar, Batya, in her previous lifetime, she was. Chava Eve, the wife of Adam, the first man. And who was Moshe in the previous lifetime? It was Hevel. As you know, the, the very three letters of Moshe stands for Mem, for Moshe. Before Shin, he was Sheth. And before that, it was He, Hevel. Consequently, who was Moshe to, to Batya? She was the mother in previous lifetime, and he was the, da the son. You understand what I'm saying? You get the point? Pacha was Eve, Emotia was Hevel. She felt it she, intuitively. That's why Pacha saved Moshe Rabbeinu. So consequently, and we can give many I, uh, more examples, but I just want to say this Gilgulim is Gematria Chesed, that sometimes a person pays not this innocent million and a half Jews, Jewish children, six million Jews. They were good and perfect, observed, good fight Jews. Why did Hashem not intervene? Just like we say with Eov, Hashem could have also saved Eov, but it was for his own perfection, for his own healing, what he did in a previous uh, Gilgul, so that's what the Jews hid, the six million Jews also, but they, not, they deserved. But for their life, for example, I give again the example of my father, what they did before. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a topic which we could speak days on an end, but you see somebody's here and forced me to stop. Okay, thank you very much.